Okay, so we <laughs> we're back. Um, we'll vote. and I totally forgot where where we were. We were. So have I. Um, <laughs> I was rambling about um, oh, uh, historical different. accuracy. Yes. We were talking about yeah, um, the TV show I did Vikings and your book books plural uh, and <clears throat> whether I noticed any difference or similarities in like mm -hmm. historical accuracy and I was saying I didn't notice when I started reading your book nothing jumped out to me which tells me that it was essentially when I watch like historical stuff like if I don't notice anything or I'm not sat on my sofa being like, hmm, with that, then that tells me that that's all I that, that's all I need to know is that it's realistic enough for me to be immersed in it. Right. I mean, yeah. you're always going to get like, oh, I remember season. <laughs> I remember season one of Vikings. And I'm so sorry that I can't name check this person. I just <laughs> their, their Twitter handle. But I remember getting a furious tirade from someone on Twitter. No. But yeah, in, in season one of Vikings, because <clears throat> I crossed myself the wrong way with my hands in a scene. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I think I did inside and then out, and I think it's supposed to be outside. Yeah, out and in, yeah. And in. Oh, I might have got that wrong. I don't know. <laughs> um, but like, it, it was like the end of the world for this person. Clear. And, and it was a real, like, you know, Vikings was my first big TV show, and you know, that was a real eye-opener for me because it's different to theatre, being an actor in TV and film. You don't, you never very, well, you very rarely meet your audience. And if you do, it's usually six months or a year after when you did that performance. Mm -hmm. And when someone lovely comes up and says, you know, hello. And um, so it, it's, it was like a real like, oh, wow. Yeah, there are really people watching. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> There's people watching and they have really passionate views about, you know, it goes back to that thing we were talking about, like your your readers have expectations about what you write and <clears throat> the yep. whole kind of how much do you want to cater for that mm -hmm. reader and how much do you want to do your own thing? Um again, I've wandered off on like some massive No, challenge. that's that's no, that's totally fun. <laughs> yeah. Like I okay, know yeah. like with my series that I've done enough research where I made software decisions on a couple things that I decided to change um, from the historical accuracies. I tried to keep as much of it true, but there were a couple things that I thought would be as on the fantasy side, more entertaining, for instance, the concept of a throwing ax. Then as far yeah. as I'm aware, the Vikings didn't really do that. They had a lot of axes, I'm sure. Yes, they probably threw them, but it wasn't like a what we think of nowadays, at least here in the US, the concept of axe throwing places are taken off, but we're not tossing hatchets. Here as well. Yeah. 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 So it's one of those. Uh, I knew that one. There are a couple other ones where if someone came up and asked, I'll be like, yeah, I understand. I actually, hopefully, you know, validly made an aware decision of why I chose to incorporate something versus not. But yeah. again, I will say I'm fantasy with. A lot of historical stuff in it but it's still high fantasy we're set in midgard not earth we're dealing with the nine worlds not one planet <laughs> yeah no exactly and like there were a couple of lit like not as much as your series but um in the tv show vikings there was little elements of fantasy in it mm -hmm. and i remember what michael the writer said was at the time was it what it, it, like it wasn't fantasy you know um we see it as fantasy from our modern western perspective but really like this was absolutely reality for them at the time mm -hmm. and and i kind of i'll be totally honest I, <laughs> and when we did the show i was like a bit um like okay but i'm not sure i can buy into this like a uh, fine yeah okay like I think you we set I we set off thinking we were making a historical TV show, you know, mm -hmm. and then suddenly this like fantasy element came in, and we were like, "Why wow, no, it doesn't." And I have to say, from the get go with your books, like that made a lot more. It, it makes a lot more sense to me than mm -hmm. some of the fantasy elements 
in the series I did because <clears throat> I don't know you just paint it you paint it in such a realistic way that it it much more represents to me what I think the writers on Vikings were trying to say about their elements in the series mm -hmm. in that this was their reality like the fantasy element of your books it just if like it probably the wrong thing to say but it doesn't feel like fantasy like it as in it just feels like their reality it feels like um that was their world at the time they had these protectors and um you know they yeah it's not fantasy it's yeah well, that, was, I, I, that was one thing is like because i fell in love with the era of the viking culture and the people during that era and um, but also their mythology, you know, and enjoying reading, I know, again, going back to the cringe stuff of the Eddas and the sagas and everything. I don't think it's cringe. I love it. I absolutely, absolutely do. But kind of going down my little rabbit hole into Wonderland and everything, but did discover that whole thing that I thought was, is the premise kind of like, well, at least that seed that started the idea um, when I found out that the people during the Viking era believe that there were four parts to a human and you know at least here and you know what i'm aware of was mind body and soul and they had a totally different split dynamic on what comprises a person in a way that was yeah. so different than what i've come across in even other mythologies that i was like why hasn't anybody written about these garden animal creatures or this kind of deep uh, entity female entities that represent uh, luck that kind of goes through your genetic lines. And yeah. then I was like, oh, wait, I'm a writer. I guess I could do that. <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do it. It's one of those. It really was one of those moments. I was like, why can't I find? Because I started looking it up. I was like, I would love to read a fantasy book about this. And then I just like did that. Oh, wait, um, I know what I do for a living. I can maybe do that. <laughs> Let's so at least cool. dabble and try. <laughs> yeah. That is so cool. That is like how everyone wants to talk about coming up with their idea right it's like why can't I find oh wait hang on <laughs> that's great that's amazing and it's so original like when you read it it's you know I definitely again not sure how much I should admit here but like I had not come across it like I had not come across that way of thinking about what makes up a person and all these animal protectors and um it just feels really original like it feels and a really cool context to do it in the Viking world, because I, I, I guess now I could imagine that you know, you could have those kinds of elements in a totally different universe or like, yeah, with a different backdrop. But mm -hmm. yeah, really cool in a, a Viking world. It's yeah, very... I, had, I had one person who read, um, has been reading the series, and kind of paused and was like, "This reminds me of his Dark Materials," and like the animals that were, you know, paired with everybody. And I was like, I, I was like, yeah, you know, I wonder if, um, you know, we had similar kind of stumbled upon Fuja, both of us or not. But on the other hand, you know, theirs was the representation of a person's soul in an animal form that walked by yeah. their side versus mine's not actually their soul. That is a different subcomponent. This is their, um, just a true guardian to the angel, guardian animal, yeah. that just someone that watches you and tries to be your conscience <laughs> because you're not supposed to actually see them. It's essentially your conscience that kind of guides you through life. Yeah. It's kind of cool. And it does, it feels like, um, because I, I've read some of his dark materials. I've not finished it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but like, it feels the, the, <clears throat> um animal protectors in your series like they they feel a bit more independent or like mm -hmm. they feel like their own entity connected mm -hmm. but like their own entity with their own thoughts and feelings and yeah they inform one another's thoughts and feelings but they feel like characters in their own right or as i remember reading his dark materials and it feeling like a kind of manifestation of the inner soul like you said or mm -hmm. there's it's different it's yeah they they do have like similarities but they also do have striking at least for me it's fairly striking but then again i'm very intimate with my material <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. differences too but uh but yeah so 
Um, actually, question for you, just because I want to know, and now I have you on film, I'm going <laughs> to ask. Yeah. Um, since you've read now, obviously, the first two, let me, I was, I'm actually curious, who is your favorite character in the start of the series? Because I know as the series progresses, there's going to be some drastic changes with certain characters, some that you maybe you don't like in the beginning, you'll probably really like at the end, or at least I hope you do, and vice versa. But uh, I'm just curious right now, because you've started off the series and have met a good number of the cast so far. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is like back, back a question. Well, not really a question or a statement. And also, I don't want to spoil it for anyone watching. But I remember when we started book one, I think in a note somewhere, you wrote to me like... I did. <laughs> I really... I know, but you wrote like, oh, I, I can't wait for you to meet so-and-so character because I think you'd be really good to play him. I'm yeah. not going to say it. I, I did. But... Uh, I did. Yeah, you did. And I remember <laughs> arriving at him as a character in book one and being like, no. <laughs> she for real? Like, what? Like, me? Him? Uh, like, what? So I, I, I'm assuming that there's a big... Oh, yeah. He's actually going to be one of my... He's one of my two favorite characters I'm writing right okay, now. And it. I'm, I'm also it. in volume... 12 of 16 it's a long series oh i apologize goodness. wow so hopefully no. i don't bore you halfway through <laughs> <laughs> it won't uh amazing um but yeah, yeah. He's, he, he's one and then um for my other one that i just enjoy just because i get a chuckle is the character skeggy because he's, oh, he's yeah. just a, no, he's a sweet softy and yeah i don't know i really like him but no he's my great reasons I, and his, his, the layers of the story as he progresses too it's kind of interesting to me but how about you because you're again in the beginning yeah no I I it's really fascinating as well when I, like I do audiobooks um because some authors works not even some others works some characters within books immediately like you see them like you see the fully formed character in your mind's eye what the particular shade of their beard hair is like <laughs> every detail of their face and their mm -hmm. and Skeggy was definitely one of them for me like back like as soon as I arrived at him in the book I was like I know who this guy <laughs> is. like and then other characters you kind of get like shades or ideas of what mm -hmm. they might be like in your mind's eye like kind of hand-drawn sketches of maybe who they are and mm -hmm. um, I find that fascinating because it kind of it tells me how easily I'm going to be able to like represent them mm -hmm. on, on, on first attempt or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, pro I mean, I'm always a sucker for a protagonist. I've got the whole, I'm a hero complex nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> so of course, like I'm just a massive fan of leaf. Like I, I think also when you come to do audiobooks or if as an actor, you naturally try to, align yourself with the person telling the story or an actor on screen you're always trying to see it from your like character's point of view like yeah a bit egotistical but you do like that's your job is you have to invest in that character so I'm I'm really invested in belief like I I, I hope so because I feel like yeah. there, there are certain books and certain um stories where the main character is not supposed to be a likable character but she is one right, that yeah. i i do hope people enjoy and yes she has her own grievances and little issues and someone may be like well she's too meek and mild i'm like well yes but you know you're going to see her develop and come you know a little stronger and she is not her sister her sister is that if you want that strong self-confident person you have that character too and it was a challenge for me to make to make a main character that wasn't that I am a warrior woman. I am yeah. I'm ready. Let's go kind of persona. I wanted to try to challenge myself to be like, OK, I can write someone that's fairly different from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, full disclosure, I'm massively intimidated by Herbal. <laughs> I'm not there right now. Like I get, I get nervous when I approach having to read her. <laughs> no, but I like I. I think that's the way it should be. Like, I, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe that's more of a comment on me, but I, I always find I'm, I'm weirdly more intimidated by, like, not just strong female characters, but, like, mm -hmm. her voice, like, a 
she's <laughs> very intense. strong yeah she's, she's yeah. intense yeah. and like they were like like you know i remember like you referenced lagatha like catherine mm-hmm. the actress who played that character on vikings the tv show like i was just like a gibbering wreck around her on set because <laughs> it's really impressive to be around like mm-hmm. you know strong female presence like that and yeah um yeah her voice uh yeah, I'm just scared of her. <laughs> well, well, good. But you know, in the best in the <laughs> best of fun. ways, because yeah, no. Nah. And it's it's been fun to create a character like her, her who has so many things that, at least for me, again, I I can't say it enough. I love a good, strong powerhouse woman. You know, I one of my favorite movies when I was younger was Aliens, because Ripley at that time, there wasn't a lot of um strong female characters on cinema to that extent and now that's changed thankfully but I really just am drawn to those kind of characters and so yeah even still you want to make sure she has flaws and has things that will hinder her and she's not perfect by any means but you know yeah no and it's great like I I I really struggle to connect with characters um whenever I'm watching stuff or reading stuff like watching films and TV shows, I really struggle to connect with characters on screen that haven't shown me any vulnerability Mm -hmm. within an hour or two of watching them. Mm -hmm. I kind of write them off, (laughs) (laughs) which is really bad. But like, because often characters do, you know, at the end of a season, or you can be like four seasons into a TV show and then suddenly be like, oh, Oh, they are. They've got like a soul. <laughs> yep. um, so, you know, always give them the benefit of the doubt. But like, I think her voice is done brilliantly because you do like everything you were talking about earlier about her glass ceiling and she's in this world where she just, she can't. It's so nice because you get to see even the strongest characters in your world. They've all got things that they're fighting against. They're all, mm-hmm. they've all got those battles to fight you know mm-hmm. and like literally and uh not but um yeah I, I I struggle with characters who you don't see vulnerability you know even Skeggy like there's you've created that whole dynamic where like you know <laughs> it's just absolutely head over heels in love and yeah you know he's he's well yeah well yeah. <laughs> god bless <laughs> bless him jesus no <laughs> but no he's and i do like that kind of parent where again i am not well i know it's very very popular to come across um romantic fantasy and my fantasy as at the moment i would not categorize any of them as romantic fantasy but as in life there needs to be romantic elements if even not forefront on the side in them because that's part of life and so to have some of these side stories and side characters that you get to see and even the main characters down the line you know see different romances and interest and the drama of that that's totally fine but the point of the story is the epic that's going to take it beyond (laughs) yeah 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 no but i like i think very quickly any stories that are created where it's just epic or like Mm -hmm you are you you do often become bored like as as epic and incredible as like the Mm -hmm. you know massive five thousand piece battle scene that you've seen in lord of the rings if it doesn't come back to like you know pick it and yeah like if it doesn't come back to something that reflects on our own life in some way Mm -hmm. like the basic like interworkings of family life or mm-hmm. yeah then that's what really keeps us hooked to a story i think yeah and i mean as in any good fantasy has to have re- realistic elements and have really you know something that you can relate to even if you don't live in a world where or a universe that's centered around a giant tree and you have nine worlds you can still yeah. find relatability in characters and you know sometimes it's the subtlety sometimes it's bigger things but that's kind of the key i think to good fiction especially in the fantasy yeah. area is relatability in a character or situation yeah 100 
and, and hopefully, doing, but... hopefully I don't bore you because yes, the series will leave Midgard eventually. But that was one of the things is I know if I, I kind of say it's slightly slow to start, but I really want to immerse you in the characters, their society, what they believe in, how they existed in their world before I take you out and you start seeing some of these other well, realms that are in, a, you know, from Norse mythology and these other creatures. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to get to the fantasy aspect. So hopefully, again, I don't bore you, but. <laughs> of course you, I, of course you won't bore me. Sorry if I keep saying things that are like wildly offensive. I don't know. How don't dare you? Do. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> no, like I'm, I'm saying the opposite of your books. I'm saying that you don't do that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I can't wait. Like, I can't wait to see where it goes. <laughs> um yeah so we'll, we'll 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 jump on and i'll have to go send you yeah. set up that that third one for you soon because i know we were talking about that this past yeah. week but uh but yeah i think we're kind of covered a lot of my notes that so it, is there yeah. anything else you want to say about because i think a lot of people who are curious about the audiobook process you know might want to know you mentioned it a little bit earlier but what is like maybe the one thing that you love the most about being an audiobook narrator? And what is one thing that like gets under your skin or you dislike about, you know, that process? Because it's just like very different from your other acting careers. And uh... yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I, I think the thing that I love about it is that um, It has unlocked, I'm trying to formulate this idea. <laughs> Scientific <laughs> side. Um, it, it's kind of unlocked in me like a bravery. Okay, yeah. I, I, I sometimes, this is way too honest, um, <laughs> but I sometimes lack maybe in my other work. Mm. What I mean by that? I mean like the beautiful thing about that I find when I watch performances on screen <clears throat> is that they are so intimate when you have a 50 millimeter lens on a camera that's on someone's face and you blow it up on a cinema screen you can see everything like you mm -hmm. can see inner workings of that human being's mind <clears throat> and that's really when it's done at the best highest level it moves you so much when you see a performance on screen that is yeah. it does me like it, it can be incredible to watch the the not so great part about that is that it is very revealing um and <laughs> you are braver see i think you're braver than me in the sense that you are willing to do that sort of thing for me i'm like i i i write a book you don't yeah, <laughs> but I think, um, what what tends to happen when you work more on screen as an actor is that you you become aware of that. You become aware of like how like wow that instrument that camera over there is literally boring into my soul. That's really shit. <laughs> Excuse my language. Sorry. Um, that's really intense and you yeah. watch it back or you go and watch your first film that comes out with your family and you're like that's that's I don't know if I wanted mm -hmm. I don't know if I was up for sharing that <laughs> my, <laughs> well, you know what I mean and mm -hmm. and what can happen it's sh it's not what should happen but what can happen is you can weirdly become more shy or like more reserved or you make choices especially if you've made some bad choices <laughs> as an actor on screen, you start working out how you can make choices that are safer. I mean, mm -hmm. we all, in every yeah. walk of life, like in any industry, um, you're trying to minimize risk. Uh, and the exact opposite is required in art, in any art form. As an author, you're trying to do something that's not safe and conventional. You want to do something mm -hmm. that's outside the box. Same with acting. And audiobooks, I think, when I started doing them four years ago, maybe I was in a place, I'm being way too honest, <laughs> maybe I was in a place where, like, I'd, I'd, I don't know, become a bit safe as mm -hmm. an actor, honestly. Like, you, you, um, 
you know, start making choices that are a bit the easy choices or like, you know, safe. And the thing about doing audiobooks is that you you're in a confined soundproof booth. You're on your own. Like there's no no one's filming you. There's no one else there really to watch you. I mean, there's a producer the other side of the glass, but honestly, yeah. they're so like obsessed with their notes and the editing software that they're not. And you're there and there's like no time to think you've just got to create 50 characters go create a world and it it's very liberating like that's honestly yeah that was a really long way of saying that was a good thing <laughs> doing audiobooks you were looking for like one line answers no for... i like that i like that no it um, is... again but uh that's what i love about audiobooks is that you can't like and you can be anything you know in the screen world particularly like in the in the 12 years I've been working as a professional actor when I graduated from drama school there was a bit more freedom to kind of audition for roles that were maybe not you or like mm -hmm. there was an opportunity to transform a bit honestly now it's um if the role is not this like dark hair and blue eyes I probably won't get seen for it or I won't you know, hmm. be considered for it. Um, because there are so many actors now and so much content that, anyway, I'm way off on a tangent, but <clears throat> you get my point, like doing an audiobook suddenly, like look at the characters in your book. Like I can be so many different versions hmm. of humanity, like, and just throw myself into it. So yeah, that's what I love about them. The thing that I... I'm like, okay, this is not fun. <laughs> oh no. Um uh, <clears throat> I think I said like right at the start, about 70 hours ago when we started this chat, <laughs> I said um that they're the hardest things that I've ever done mm -hmm. as, an, as an actor, and they really are. And people don't understand that. Like when you say I'm doing an audiobook and you come back, like I come home after doing them at night or I come back in from the shed and I, I just look ill like <laughs> Laura is like are you okay like you just <laughs> and people don't get it because they're like what you so you just sit and read a book that sounds pretty easy but I I ask anyone to try like just go and lock yourself in a cupboard and see how long you last see how long you last <laughs> reading like and there'll be loads of other narrators maybe like watching this being like yeah, it's really easy, dude. And you might find it easy. That's cool, but I don't. Like, it's it's. Oh, you're getting you're putting yourself in so many different headspace. Like this character, it's just headspace, psychological this character's um, headspace, and there's and you know with you your background and actually as a you know stage actor, I can only imagine you trying to actually be those characters to some extent, and that's a lot of shifting. <laughs> yeah, like specific like. I love doing audiobooks. I sounded like I was about to go on like a big complaining rant. I wasn't. Just specifically the thing that I find <clears throat> hard is the psychological mm -hmm. aspect of being uh, in front of black words on white paper in a confined booth for a, a lengthy period of time. And what I mean by that is like, if you've ever had that sensation of saying a word too many times, mm -hmm. that it starts to lose its meaning, Yes. Imagine that, but like every word in the English. <laughs> <laughs> like after you've been doing it for a couple of hours, you stop seeing like sentences. Like you start seeing like black ink yep. on paper. Does that make sense? Like you, yeah. it, it's, um, and you, you, you start, your tongue starts like not being able to work. To, like you start being like, what? Like I'm not, it's so, it's so weird. I can't describe it. It's, so much more a psychological thing than I thought it would be. I mean, I understand, you know, as, as a writer, I mean, I've had similar scenarios, one, writing new material, because that's a lot yeah, to get yeah. into, but the editing process too, because then you're going through a lot quicker on one hand. On the other hand, you know, you're still trying to read through all these characters, making sure they sound right. And I've had, I've had a couple of those moments where you just stare at the sentences and I'm just like, you almost get dizzy from them because you're like, whoa, I am... I need a break. <laughs> yeah. Time out for this today. We're done. <laughs> yeah. No, it is that. But um, but yeah, I love I've loved doing your series at home because 
it's um like it really uh, I've never experienced that like there's no other part of my job as an actor where I can just do it from home <laughs> I have to I have to go to a film set or like a theater or mm-hmm. you know even audiobooks before I discovered the you know the format on ACX and the Amazon thing you had to go into a studio mm-hmm. in, in central London and and it's great because you can kind of yeah dip in and out of being creative when you want it must be similar to being a writer that must be the hardest I, I can see we've not got any time left but like a little question for you like how do you schedule your time like as a writer I would imagine I would never get a book finished like I don't I'd be like cool I've written a paragraph that's <laughs> no. I'm kind of amazing <laughs> <laughs> no um sometimes those are you have days and that you write that paragraph and that's all you get done and you feel amazing and that's it <laughs> you achieve yeah, wow but but yeah no I've um I was actually homeschooled for the most of my life growing up and so I kind of have that innate ability of setting your own schedule and being pretty good about it and I think that helps a lot in my writing process because yeah. you know I get up and I'll do my preliminary morning social media because you got to market yourself then I jump into the mornings. I try to dedicate pr- predominantly to new material. And I try I try to do so many pages a day. That's my goal. And leave the afternoon open for whatever else may need, be it the editing, the formatting, the by the social is, media, so and these interviews the and stuff. Yeah. Like, what, what is the page count? Oh, um, well. <laughs> How many pages do you try and get done a day? Because genuinely, I mean, seriously, like, if I was like, oh, two pages today would be great. Like, for me, I mean... <laughs> Like uh, um, recently I've been kind of d- down to two pages a day but that's just because there's been a lot of stuff all at once and I've had to dedicate more time to some of my works that are in different stages of everything be it I'm going to be releasing volume eight um, towards well kind of midway through November and getting that one ready yeah. and stuff like that but for the rate me cannot be two pages a day like you release books like every I, 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 I was, like, well like <laughs> well well there, there's a trick to it but yeah I try okay. my goal especially going next year my goal will really be hitting that four page mark a day and, but it's one of those things also you when you've written enough um some things come a little more naturally now obviously maybe a descriptive scene and I've been starting a new book so I that's kind of slowed me down because I'm doing those a lot of descriptions and explaining and backstory versus an action scene which I can move quickly through or dialogue that's pretty quick so it also depends on what part of the story that I'm working on that day but yeah my goal usually was trying to hit as close as I can to four pages but I'll be honest recently it's only been two but (laughs) you again you get that paragraph on that on the paper and you smile (laughs) yeah yeah no it's amazing like I could never do what I I've said this to people before but like the idea of a blank page terrifies me, like genuinely. Uh, I'm definitely a, someone who needs something to then, inter- is that called an interpretative, yeah. interpretative artist? <laughs> like I need, like I can't just create something from scratch. Mm. <laughs> like I need to interpret something that someone's put. So I'm just always massively in awe of people who can do that. It's Hey, everybody has like, that's why I was like, when I look at you and you are so talented in so many ways, again, your acting career, your music, you have so many things that it's just mind boggling to me. And I can't even begin to think about. So I think everybody, and I guess that's part of your characters, everybody has their strengths. And so it's nice to understand that I may not, and I understand I'm never going to be you, but that's okay. Because, you know, we work together very well and produce. You wouldn't want to be. (laughs) <laughs> exactly exactly we we work well together yeah um amazing yeah well thank you for coming out i know our time is going to kick us out again and no, i do want to say the official goodbye um but thank you for coming out and talking with me i've been so excited about this for so long and yeah, thank and thank you for having a chat and it's just really nice to talk about one another's process yeah. and meet one another like exactly like, you know, <laughs> and then well. talk about it. yeah it's really nice and yeah send me book three I can't I wait will. and if you ever <laughs> want to do one of these again let me know because I, I yeah. am an extrovert who works at the house all day so these kind of things are my social Got it. <laughs> Got it.
Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, thank you for everybody chiming in and I'm going to stop the recording. Okay.